All right, good morning. How's everybody? Good? Y'all awake? Kind of sort of? A little bit? All right. Good deal. My name is, uh, my name is Derek Osborne. I'm the executive director of an organization called Pride of Tuscaloosa. We are a drug and alcohol prevention organization. Uh, does anybody know what prevention is? Y'all have to talk. I'm not going to talk for 45 minutes. So. Do not pay attention to them. Y'all yeah, don't, don't pay attention to him. I'm trying not to. <laughs> Uh, does anybody know what prevention refers to when to we talk to, when we're talking about something? What's that? To try to keep you from doing something. Try to keep you from doing something. Try to prevent something from happening. In this case, when we talk about substance abuse, we talk about drugs. What are we trying to prevent? Use of drugs. Use of drugs, yes. Drug addiction. Drug addiction. Drug addiction. So, I'm <coughs> not here to tell you how to live your lives. I'm not here to tell you this drug will kill you. I'm not here to tell you that pot will make you go into convulsions. I'm not here to lie to you and try to aggrandize things to the point that it scares you. Years and years of, of prevention have been done. Um, you may have heard of something called Just Say No. Has anybody ever heard that before? Uh, anybody ever heard of Okay, so there was a campaign back in the 80s that was drug prevention based that was Just Say No. That was back in the Reagan administration. Uh, and coincidentally, we were started during that day and age. We, were, we became a 501c3, which is a nonprofit status in 1986, uh, with the help of Nancy Reagan. Um, there was also the D.A.R.E. program, which many of you may know what that is. If you had the D.A.R.E. program at your high school, uh, where they came in and there was a little dog or something, and they had some commercials and some animations and some other stuff. We are a little bit different from all of those things. We take a real world approach to this because the truth is, is that uh, I don't believe in scare tactics. You may have seen uh, on the internet, you may have seen something called like faces of meth, which is somebody that has been arrested, they have a mugshot of them, and then five years later they get arrested again and they've been on meth the whole time and they look like their teeth are falling out and everything else. I don't show you that kind of stuff because that's not really what we're there for. We can if you want to see it, but that's not really what we do. We're here to give you facts. We're here to try to make you aware of different things. Uh, and this is all stuff that is put in place to help you guys make better decisions for yourself. I assume y'all go to school because y'all want to go have a career. And you want to go further your education and have a good career and uh, have a good job. And does anybody know what the biggest issue is with new employees, with hiring new employees in this day and age? What's the biggest problem they run into? Can't pass the drug test. What's that? Can't pass the drug test. So you go through all this stuff, you spend all this money, or you spend your parents' money, or you spend whoever's money, or you have a huge student loan, and then you go out to get a job, and you can't get a, you can't get a job because you cannot pass the drug test. So we come to talk to you about these things. We have a grant with the Department of Mental Health uh, that has helped us put this in place so we can give this presentation to you guys during orientation. We're going to talk about a couple of things that are mentioned in the grant. Number one, number one being something you've never heard of, which is alcohol. Y'all know what alcohol is? No. Right. Okay. He did. Okay. Good. All right. And we're going to talk something about. We're going to talk about prescription drugs as well. We can talk about anything that y'all want to talk about. We do an immense amount of research on drugs and chemical composition and availability, and where the drugs come from, and how they get into our country. So if you have any kind of questions or anything like that, if you've heard myths or anything like that that you want to debunk, you can ask us. Uh, we, I'm not saying that we know everything, but we do know a, a good bit. So I figured we, we would just kind of break the ice, we'd get started, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to do a quiz. It's not for a grade, it's just going to, there's going to be a question pop up on your screen and it's going to have some multiple choice answers. All you do is just yell out which one you think it is. And if you're wrong, that's okay. I had uh, one student yesterday that it didn't matter what it was, uh, he yelled C every time. He's like, that's C. It's, it's C, and it wasn't C every time, but it was entertaining. So, if y'all are ready, here we go. What does it mean to be addicted? And I can read these out, but I'm pretty sure you guys can read, so. Hey, all right, everybody in agreement. Hey, okay. So, being mentally and physically dependent, being mentally and or physically dependent on something. Do you have to be both to be addicted? No. No. Is there such thing as a mental addiction and not necessarily a physical? 
Absolutely. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we get going. All right, alcohol. Most of you guys know what alcohol is. Let's see how good your knowledge is. Alcohol is a stimulant, hallucinogen, depressant, steroid. C. C. C is correct. So it's weird because when you start drinking alcohol, you typically have you have like a bolt of energy. You feel up. You feel ready to go. You're getting ready to tailgate or party or whatever it is. But as you go on, your energy goes down. If you are a depressed person, sometimes people that are depressed decide to uh, use drinking as their coping mechanism for depression. Is that smart? No, you're putting a depressant on top of being depressed, which is not a good idea. All right, which alcohol makes you the drunkest? Beer, wine, shots, moonshine? What's on? What's that? You didn't classify what was in the shot or what alcohol level the moonshine is. There you go. We're getting there. Good job. <laughs> Good answer. But the correct answer is E. So let's talk about what he said. Here's a chart for you. Now, when somebody says they are going to have a drink or they've had a drink or two drinks, this is by measurement what they're supposed to be talking about. So you've got 12 ounces of beer, which equals to 89 fluid ounces of malt liquor. All of this is dependent on the amount of alcohol that's in it. And then you've got five fluid ounces of table wine, depending on the, here again, depending on the strength of the, uh, of the drink. And then you've got roughly 1.5 fluid ounces of liquor. And that is using a 40% alcohol by volume measurement. So if somebody says, well, I only had one glass of wine, but they fill that wine glass at the top, is that one drink? That would technically be two drinks. Even if you can fill it up in one cup, you say, well, I only had one drink. What about the, 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 the tall boy at Outback? How many fluid ounces is that? You go get a beer at Outback, you get the tall one. Anybody know how many ounces that is? No? Okay, good. It's good that you don't know. What's that? It's like 20 something. Actually, it's 32. Yes. I'm so, sure everybody here is old enough to do that. Well, that's okay. I'm sure they've never drank before. Right, so they have a 32 ounce beer. If you drink a 32 ounce beer, how many is that one drink? No, it's almost three. So you can't say I went out back and had a beer. You went and had almost three beers. All right, so back to the liquor part. What is proof as it relates to alcohol? Double, double, the, double the percentage. Very good. All right, so. Measure, it's measure of alcohol contained within a beverage, alcoholic beverage, so, and you're exactly right. So if you've got 40% alcohol by volume, that means it's 80 proof. So if you see a bottle that has a proof on it, you don't know exactly what that means, you just know the number, the higher the number, the more alcohol in it, that would be correct. But if you've got like, for instance, this Bacardi bottle, what is it for the math people in here? No one? Alright, so 75.5%. Alright, which is pretty high, right? Which is why this they use this like if you top something off and then you light it, it lights on fire because it's flammable. And just fun fact, Bacardi 151 has a safety valve in there so you can't light the bottle. If you light the bottle, what happens? It's a small top. That's exactly right. Alright, what is BAC? is correct. Who said D? Anyone? All right, good. Blood alcohol content, also, also called blood alcohol concentration, blood ethanol concentration. It's the most commonly used metric to measure whether or not you are impaired. So, at what blood alcohol content level are you considered impaired? 0 0.02, 0 0.08, 0 0.10, 0 0.20, 0.40. B. B is correct. Who all know that? Everybody know that? Pretty much? Okay. Point of A is correct, unless what? Anybody? One factor could be important for you guys. Age. Age. Good. If you're under 21, what's the legal limit? Zero. 
actually .02 by law. But if you get arrested or if you get pulled over and they ask you to blow and you blow double zero but they smell alcohol on you, can they arrest you? Absolutely they can. Absolutely they can. If they think you are impaired in any way, shape, or form, doesn't matter if you blow double zero, they can take you to jail. Now, it may not stand up in court, but at that point it doesn't really matter because you're going to jail and they're impounding your car. So you're still going to have to pay and deal with all of that. So just something to be aware of. They don't really care. And Brianna can tell you a little bit about that. She met with the DUI guys a few weeks ago, and they confirmed all of this, and that's, the way that they, that's just the way that they look at it. Which drugs are not safe to mix with alcohol? You guys always is quiet? Pretty much? Okay. <laughs> Adderall, Xanax, Tylenol, pepto -bismol. It could be multiples, by the way. Uh, Tylenol is a blood thinner. Okay. And alcohol is already a blood thinner. Okay. So if you have to get a cut or wounded, it could get out faster. Okay. What'd you say? All right, good. That is correct. Sorry, this slide doesn't like to work sometimes. All right. The answer is A, B, and C. Okay, so what is Adderall? Uh, ADD medication. ADD medication. ADD, ADHD. That's right. What is it classified as? Does anybody know? It's a depressant. It's actually a stimulant. All right. And does anybody know what it most resembles in terms of like street drugs? Okay. It's close. It's actually closer to an amphetamine. So it's actually a little bit closer chemical composition wise to meth, even though it's not meth, but it's, it's very, very similar in composition. But it's stimulant. So what happens when you put a stimulant on top of a depressant? So well, okay. So it's so it's not smart to mix any medication with alcohol. Number one, all right. But being more specific, this one is one of those where you drink, you start going down. The party's still going on. What do you need? You need something to pick you back up because the party's still kicking, right? But you're going down, so you do something else. Some people, some some students, some I mean, not even students. Some people overall will use this as a stimulant to wake them back up. This is a pretty good, pretty good way to get alcohol poisoning because your body is sending different signals to yourself. Your brain's telling you to keep going, you're stimulated, your body's going, hey, you've had way too much, cut it out. And it's a very, very good way to get alcohol poisoning and to overdo it. What about Xanax? What is that? Okay. What do you use it for? What are you supposed to use it for? Anxiety, right. Anti-anxiety medicine, right? So it's a benzo, which is supposed to relax you if you're stressed out. It's supposed to be something you can use to be less stressed. What happens when you mix it with alcohol? Well, instead of being relaxed, you're about relaxed times ten. And the biggest issue with it is, is that most people either pass out or they're not coherent. They may be doing things but they don't know what they're doing, and when they wake up in the morning, they can't remember what they've done. This is something that has been used lately as a daybreak drug because it is something somebody can drop in a drink pretty easily, and you can drink it, and then you don't know what happened. You wake up the next morning, you don't know where you are or, or anything else. So girls don't leave your drinks on the table. Guys do, but mostly girls. Uh, what about Tylenol? Why Tylenol? Because of your liver. Because of your liver. That's right. So Tylenol is basically acetaminophen, all right? If you read the back of a bottle of acetaminophen, it'll tell you that there's a certain amount that you should take in order to avoid any type of long-term liver damage. And I can't exactly tell you exactly how much it is. I want to say it's like 1,000 milligrams within a 24-hour period, something like that. So it says don't take more than this and within a certain amount of time. If you add alcohol to it, alcohol naturally does damage to your liver. And when you put it with acetaminophen, it amplifies the effects. All right, if you want to sober up quickly, you should take a nap, take a cold shower, drink coffee, none of the above. D, C, anybody else? No one? Y'all are like the quietest class, seriously. Everybody 
everybody else was just blah, blah, blah. All right, none of the above. The only thing that will sober you up is what? What's that? Not drinking. <laughs> not drinking, yes. Yes, not drinking and time. time. Right, right. That's the only thing that will actually get a minute down. You could take a cold shower. It'll probably help wake you up and make you more, I guess, uh, aware, but it's not going to get the alcohol out of your system. We'll come back to metabolizing of alcohol in a minute. Binge drinking is probably the biggest issue with your age group. What is binge drinking? <laughs> it could be, right? You could binge drink while you watch TV. Uh, which one is it? B. B. B is right. Alright, so this is you drinking a large amount of alcohol in a very, very short amount of time. Typically your age group, if you decide to drink, which I know none of you do. But if you did, most of you don't go out and just have one or two drinks socially. You go out to do and start drinking to do what? To get drunk. To get what? What did you say? To have fun. To have fun. Okay. We get tamed, get lit, whatever. <laughs> so this is a huge, this is, a, this is probably the biggest problem within your age group because that's usually what y'all do. There's not a whole lot of filters there, no pun intended, but you don't, you don't just have one or two. You have a lot in a short period of time. There was a kid last week or a week and a half ago at LSU that died from alcohol poisoning. If you watch the news, you probably heard about it, but he was a legend of fraternity. Obviously had too much, they thought he just passed out, ends up he died because he, he was he had way too much alcohol in his system. And you're likely to be exposed to this uh, more more than a lot of the other things and it's just stupid. Uh, the um, and why people think it's fun to, to, to force this kind of thing on folks um, is it, it, is beyond me. But if you get in a situation where you're being asked to or forced to uh, do this kind of binge drinking, you need to get away from it because it is deadly. All right? It's not just a matter of getting drunk and then having a long time to sober up. It'll kill you. And um, you need to make sure you think about that when, you, you know, when, it, when it happens. And you're going to be exposed to it. You bet if you had an argument, exposed to it. Um, and so yeah. the, um, it's something you really ought to be aware of to protect yourself. Make sure you live a long time. Well, yeah, a lot of times this thing, this kind of thing is trivialized just because alcohol is legal. It's something that's been done for years and years and years, and it's socially acceptable, basically. So you don't think about it. It's just what people do. It's just what college students do. It's just what, you know, mom and dad might do. It's just what friends are doing. So you accept these things, but you don't necessarily have to, and it's one of those things that can get you in a lot of trouble, both physically and in your professional career. I mean, one of the things that you guys have to deal with now is social media. So you guys go out and have a good time, go to a party, even hanging out you know, with friends at the apartment or whatever, and then y'all put this stuff on social media, and these are things that can affect you long term, because when you go to get a job, some employers, a lot of employers actually, will look at your social media feed to see what kind of person you are, to see what kind of lifestyle you have. And those are things that you have to keep in mind are things that I didn't have to worry about. Uh, Mr. Howington didn't have to worry about those things. I mean, we, we did not have to do those kind of things. So something definitely to keep in mind. What is withdrawal? C, right. Sorry about B. Uh, Nicole put that in. Not Brian. Nicole. Nicole works in my office. Uh, the body's reaction not having a drug. So. What, what, what exactly happens when this happens? What's going on? Somebody's in withdrawal. Anybody ever seen anybody in withdrawal before? Yes, so I see some yeses. Yes, okay. So if you've seen it happen before, you know that it's nothing that you ever will have to go through. But this particular guy in this picture, he is having some type of withdrawal symptom, whether that be from drugs or alcohol or whatever it may be. He is going through withdrawals, and his body has gotten accustomed to whatever it is that he's been putting in his body, and now all of a sudden he doesn't have it anymore, and it's an incredibly painful experience. It can last for days to weeks, depending on what the drug is, what the substance is, and it's, it's the reality of what addiction, what, what happens when you have addiction, and it's why this country is in need of more treatment resources, because typically you cannot do it on your own. 
you can't, you, it's not one of these things where you can lay down in the bed for a week and figure it out and try to detox yourself and everything else. Most of the time you have to have help. There's only a very, very small percentage of people that you typically get off of some type of substance on their own. All right, average person metabolizes alcohol at a rate of one drink every 10 minutes, one drink every 30 minutes, one drink per hour, one drink per second. C is, C. C is correct, one drink per hour. If you go out one night and you have eight drinks and you drink till three o'clock in the morning and you get up at seven because you've got an 8.30 orientation class, are you still drunk? Yes. Your body has not had time to metabolize that alcohol. Can you get a DUI driving down 69 South at 7.30 in the morning? You better believe you can. When is it okay to drive drunk? Never. Well, at least look at my choice. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the guy's right. B. All right, never. This is the obvious one. And if you don't take anything else away from this, take this one, all right? There was a time and day in this city of Tuscaloosa where you would be more likely to find a million dollars on the side of the road than you would be to find a taxi. But now what do you guys have? Uber, Uber, Uber Lyft, Tuscaloosa Trolley if you're daring. There's all kind of options and they're a heck of a lot cheaper than getting in the car and putting yourself at risk or getting a DUI or uh, killing someone. Yeah, there's another question that's not on there that ought to be asked, and that's when is it? When is the, the, the good time? I'm the only good time to ride with somebody who's drinking and driving. What's the answer to that one? Never. Never. That's the same thing. Do not get in the car with somebody who's impaired. I don't care what the circumstances are. All right? Just don't do it because it's deadly. You'll end up on the side, of, you'll end up as a cross on the side of the road and Randy Travis will write another song about you. Okay? Good call. All right, these are just some stats that I included for you just so you can get an idea of kind of what, uh, what the, this problem looks like in our country. These stats were taken uh, from 2015, so one year. Uh, I'm not going to read them to you. You guys can read. I'll point out a couple of them. Um, Probably the, the one that bothers me the most is the 97,000 students that are uh, experienced alcohol-related sexual assault or date rape. Um, and these numbers are low, meaning they are very, very high numbers. They're, they're incredible numbers, but they're, are they true statistics? How many sexual assaults or date rapes don't get reported? A lot. A lot. A lot of them. These are the actual numbers that they can actually statistically tell you are true based on the data and the reports that we have. So the truth is, is that these numbers are probably a lot higher than what, it, what, uh, what is shown. All right, what is the proper way to use prescription medication? A is correct. Why is this an issue? How many of you guys have ever had an issue, uh, something wrong with you, and you go self-diagnose yourself on WebMD or something? Happens all the time. I know plenty of adults, I know plenty of older people that do it. They self-diagnose themselves so they don't want to mess with going to a doctor. And so they self-diagnose, and then they figure out what they think is wrong with them, and then they take something, or they ask somebody if they have something, or they borrow something or somebody offers them something. I can go through a laundry list of reasons that this is not, this, that this is a dangerous thing to do, but I think that you all understand that. I think that you do understand that you really should take somebody else's medication under any circumstances. If you need a medication, you feel like you need a medication, you need to go to a doctor. One of the other things that I like to point out to you guys is that your generation is a lot different in that when we were coming up, when I was in school, you didn't turn on the television and try to have some commercial tell you what drug you need to go take. But you guys see that all the time. If you sit down and y'all watch television and you're, watching a, you're actually watching a station with commercials, about every other commercial you see is for some type of pharmaceutical drug. And that's not how it was when we were coming up. When, when I was coming up, you went to a doctor you, you, and, you, and you, 
told your doctor what your symptoms were, and you said, I've got this, 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 and this, and he went, okay, based on those symptoms, I'm going to diagnose you with this, and I'm going to give you this drug that I think is best for you. Now that's changed, because y'all have learned, just through culture, media culture, and television, that you go to a doctor and you ask for a certain drug. Well, I saw this, I saw this guy, and he had restless leg syndrome, and he was was depressed and he was not feeling good and then by the end of the commercial it was all rainbows and butterflies and that's how I want my life to be and it's great. I mean, how can I have that? That's what they've instilled in y'all and it's built part of this problem with prescription drugs that we have in this country and the fact that they're floating around everywhere. So we don't question and we will never question your relationship with your doctor and what your doctor prescribes to you. What I will tell you is that if you got med if somebody's trying to give you medicine that you don't think you need, do your research on it. If somebody's trying to give you something that's not prescribed to you, don't take it. You don't know what kind of adverse reactions it may have to you. And there could be addictive properties too, where if you get addicted to something, you don't have a prescription to something, you're gonna be in a you're gonna be in a in a in a tough place. What's an opioid? Type of alcohol, drug using some medicines drug found in heroin, type of food? B. All right, who says B? Okay, all right, anybody else? Biggest B? Okay. All right, so the answer is, it's a drug found in some medicines, and it's also the drug found in heroin. And a lot of y'all don't realize this, but if you go and you get any type of pain medication, if they are an opioid-based pain medication, that could be Lortab, Norco, Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycon, Roxy's, there's plenty of other ones. You are actually taking an opiate drug, and the opium is the same thing that is found in heroin. It may be a different version of it, but it's opiate-based, which is essentially the same thing. So how does this work? How does, do, do y'all think that one day you wake up, we all, is everybody aware that we've got a heroin epidemic in this country right now? Are y'all kind of up to date on that? Somewhat? Okay, all right. So a lot of people believe or tell you that it's because doctors have overprescribed. all right? So how does that work? Who's had an injury in here before or a surgery? or a tooth bolt. All right, so what do they do when you have that injury, have that surgery? They give you pain medication, okay, which was probably needed at first. You're probably in a lot of pain if somebody just cuts you open. I'm in pain, I mean, you probably need it, all right? So how many do they give you? Okay, all right, so sometimes, more and more recently, they've gotten better with it. They'll give you maybe eight, 10 pills at most, but some doctors in the past, and some still now, would maybe have something done at the dentist, maybe they give you 30 Norcos, all right? So you start taking Norcos because your tooth hurts, understandable, all right? But when your tooth starts hurting, you start taking it, you keep, you keep taking it. You don't stop taking it because you still have pain, but you keep taking it. All right, so you run out, then what do you do? Start finding another source. Or find another source, or at that point, you could probably go back to the, the doctor that prescribed it to you and say, "Hey, I'm, I still got a little pain, right?" And he he may give you a refill. All right, so if he gives you a refill, then what do you do? You take those thirty, and then you go back to that doctor. And what does that doctor say to you then? <laughs> now you you ought to be fine by now. All right, but at this point, you've had sixty Norcos, thirty Norcos, and it doesn't take many. And then. Your brain has changed and your body is actually addicted to that substance. So what are your options? No one? Find someone, right? Go to the street, find somebody that's got some, find a friend that's got some, a family member that's got some, try to buy them on the street, they're pretty expensive. If that becomes not a plan that can that can, that can maintain, so then you move over to heroin. And most heroin users will tell you that they didn't wake up one morning and go, hey, I'm going to stick a needle in my arm today because that sounds like fun. That's not how it works. How it works is that there is a natural progression with this stuff that has become a problem in this country. 
and it does not stop because it gets out of control. And then you, everybody that takes it, not everybody that takes it, but everybody that abuses the drug has got to have that because opium is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And it takes a lot to get off of it. And this, here again, is awareness stuff. Most of y'all that we've seen so far don't understand that that's the same drug that's in heroin that's found in this pain medication. And it is. So There used to be a lot of discussion about what is a gateway drug to hard drugs. And this is an argument about whether alcohol or, or marijuana can be. But there is absolutely no doubt that these prescription drugs are gateway drugs to heroin. Because what happens is you, you run out of your prescription, and, but, you can, but heroin's the same thing. You can, and you can get it on the street. And that's one of the reasons for the current revival in the heroin trade is because of these prescription medications. And it's all tied to opium. Okay, that's where the opioid comes from. So you're, that's where morphine comes from. Uh, the, uh, which you, <coughs> if you're a serious painkiller, they give you an, it's all, but it's all from that, he's gonna show you a slide in a minute, it's all from that poppy that, that the, uh, the and it's, that's what opioid means. It's an opium drug. That's right. So the rule, the safe rule is if you have something done, if you have a surgery, if you have an injury or something, somebody gives you pain medicine, you use it until you don't have pain anymore. When you don't have pain anymore, you stop using it, throw it away, and get rid of it. All right, Schedule One drugs are considered to have no accepted medical. Does anybody know what, everybody know what Schedule is? No, not really. Okay, so the DEA, through the federal government, schedules certain illicit drugs, all right? So they put them in different categorizations based on their uses, and that's, that's what this is referring to. So you have Schedule 1 all the way down to Schedule 5. So Schedule 1 are considered to have no medical use, have some medical use, have the best effects, are considered the top drugs on the market. Any guesses? C. 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 Thank you. C. It is actually not C. That's all right. They're considered to have no accepted medical use. There's just a, a short list of what's included on Schedule One drugs. There's one in there that arguably shouldn't be in there. Which one is that? Marijuana. Marijuana. Yeah. All right. Which drug does not come from a plant? Tobacco, cocaine, marijuana, meth, heroin. Cocaine. So the correct answer is meth. Cocaine comes from the coca plant, tobacco, tobacco plant. Marijuana, of course, comes from a plant. What about heroin? Opiate. Opiate, which comes from, what he said? Poppy. Poppy. Which one of those is poppy? That pretty red flower in there. That is poppy. All right, which drugs can you not overdose from? This is the most fun question of the day because everybody will argue with me, or some people will argue with me. What drugs can you not overdose from? Nicotine, where's nicotine found? Cigarettes. Cigarettes, tobacco products, right. Alcohol, heroin, marijuana, or none of the above? Which one can you not overdose from? Marijuana. So if you were saying all, you would say none of the above? Okay. Anybody else? All right. So here's the answer. None of the above. Now, here's the question for you, because some people are sitting here going, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't die from smoking marijuana. But can you overdose? Yes. Does overdose necessarily mean death? No. You guys have probably seen news about music festivals where there's been 50 kids that overdosed and 20 of them died. So that doesn't mean they all died. It means that 20 of them did. 30 of them had to get some type of medical attention because they overdosed on a drug. Something made them sick. So how can you do that with nicotine? Anybody got a friend that ever accidentally swallowed dip? Yeah. What happened? They get really sick and throw up. That's right. That's right. Is that from just swallowing tobacco leaves? No. It's actually from getting too much nicotine in their system. 
so it makes them nauseated and they throw up. That is an overdose, that is a nicotine overdose. It also happens frequently with kids and e-cigarette juice. Y'all know what e-cigs are? All right, why is that? Because that juice that you've got is full, it's concentrated full of nicotine. It's got a lot of nicotine in it and that's the only way that it works when you vaporize it. People get their fix from the nicotine that's in the bottle. All right, so if a kid takes that, they've never had nicotine in their system before, they get a drop of it on their finger and all kids put their finger in the mouth, they get sick, they get nauseated, parents don't know what's wrong with them, they start throwing up, they take them to the hospital. This has happened a lot with e-cigarette juice because of that juice being so concentrated. So can you overdose on nicotine? Yes. You actually can die from it if you were to get too much. It's pretty rare, but it's possible. Alcohol, we already know that. Heroin. Anybody ever seen anybody that overdosed on heroin? Everybody ever seen a picture of it? What it looks like? Nobody? All right, so typically when you see somebody that's overdosed on heroin, they are passed out. It looks like they are asleep, except they are very, very blue in the face. And what happens is when you overdose on an opiate product, it doesn't necessarily have to be heroin. It can be prescription pain medication, too, if you take too much of an opiate-based painkiller. They go to sleep. And the reason that they go to sleep is because you've got receptors in your brain that are connected to your brain stem, and the brain is sending signals to your body, but your body is not getting the signals to it because of the receptors. So your body forgets to breathe. And so we typically, when you find these people, they are passed out, they're blue in the face because they're not breathing anymore, they may have a needle still stuck in their arm because it happened pretty instantaneously, and the only thing that will bring them back is a drug called Narcan which is what a lot of your first responders carry now. Uh, and what about marijuana? Can you overdose on marijuana? All right, can marijuana kill you? You guys are like the quietest <laughs> class like I've had. This must be, this got to be the camera or something. They're freaked out by the camera. Though. So, can marijuana by itself kill you? No, it cannot. Correct, correct. Can you overdose on it? Yes. How does that happen? You can smoke too much, you can do other things too much, but most of the time it's caused by edibles. Y'all know what edibles are? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've all heard of people making brownies or whatever, right? I guess. Yeah. Anyone never heard of them? Okay. Right. Make sure we're on the same page. I'm like, y'all are college students, right? So um, there's this, I'll, I'll tell you about this video and then we'll move on to some questions if you guys have any questions. But there's a video where there was a guy, it actually was a police officer, not here, but there was a police officer that broke into an evidence locker and stole some marijuana. He takes it home and he mixes it up and he and his wife make brownies. So they eat and they wait about 15, 20 minutes and nothing's happening. Why? That's right, because when you eat it as edibles, it takes a while to get into your system. You smoke it, it gets in there pretty quick, but when you eat it, it takes a little while to take that effect. So they wait 15, 20 minutes, nothing happens, so what do they do? Eat more. They eat some more. All right, so then it hits them, and then what happens? High as a kite. They're paranoid, they're delusional, they're having hallucinations, and time is moving very, very, very slowly. So this guy, knowing what the repercussions are, picks up the phone and dials 911. And he says, um, yeah, I need you to send uh, like uh, somebody, paramedics, because like um, we ate some brownies and um, I think we're dead. <laughs> and they said, you really think you're dead? He's like, yeah, yeah, like time's moving really slow and yeah, we're dying. <laughs> so. The fact of the matter is, is that had he laid down and just tried to go to sleep or something and slept it off, he would have been fine. But the paramedics come, they take him to the emergency room, he and his wife to the emergency room. Of course, it's on tape because it's a 911 call. He loses his job, and I don't think they ended up charging him. But that was a case of an overdose. One of the things that's happened in Colorado is that it's happened before. It's happened on multiple occasions where somebody will go out there on vacation, they'll have an edible, they'll eat too much, because a lot of them, a lot of them are mislabeled where you can eat too much, you can get too much, too much THC. THC, by the way, is the active ingredient in marijuana that actually makes you high. They'll eat too much and they will think the same thing, the same thing that that cop thought when he called. 
they'll think that they are dying, and it's, 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 a, it's a done deal. They're going to die, and they'll end up doing something stupid to themselves. There's been all kinds of cases where kids have jumped off balconies out there, found a gun, shot themselves because they were sure that they had overdosed on marijuana and they were actually going to die, and it was misery because they're over the hallucinations, and they go ahead and end it themselves. And that, and that is true fact. You can look that up. The YouTube video, by the way, if you get on YouTube and you type in cop, gets high on brownies or something like that, you'll find it. And it's pretty entertaining to listen to. So, um, anything I want y'all to take away today is our whole point, the whole concept of us coming and doing this with you guys is making you understand that addiction is real, all right? Here again, I, we don't come to try to tell you guys what to do with your lives or, or what's bad or what's good or anything else. Our whole focus is to give you the facts about what this stuff is and make you understand that addiction is a horrible epidemic in our country. We do not have the resources to help everybody. Statistically, there's about 25 million Americans that are addicted to something right now, and these are the ones that we can actually find, that we can, that we can actually substantiate. We're, we are equipped to handle about 10% of that number in this country. So we've got over 20 million people that if they were willing to get treatment, or maybe some of them are, they don't have access to it unless they've got a ton of money. And so they can go to you know, other places that, and you may have insurance, you may have insurance and they take it, but the point of it is, is to try to get you guys to avoid this. It's one of those things in this life that you don't need to have to, be, have to worry about. It does not need to be another barrier to what you guys want to accomplish. Do you guys have any questions? Any drug questions? Any? Yes, sir. I mean, just because like I'm an athlete and it happens to be like a factor sometimes, and okay. not really my sport, but a lot of other sports. Okay. Um, you didn't really mention very much about like steroid use. Okay, so we we don't talk much about it just because our our grant on this is supposed to be really based on alcohol and prescription drugs, which leads to opium heroin use. But uh, I mean, the steroids. Have, I mean, they they've been around forever. I mean, you probably know that. Uh, nowadays, it's more. Some of it's steroid use. A lot of the steroid stuff is still going around, but a lot of times now it's performance enhancing stuff, performance enhancing drugs, stuff that you could buy. At, at, a lot of it you can go buy at GNC, and you know that stuff's supposed to be okay. But like this happened with uh, with Will Greer, who was the quarterback in Florida. Uh, he got he, he took something from GNC, didn't check it out, didn't do his research on it. Took something because it was an enhancement. Thought he got it from GNC and thought it was okay. It ends up, it was on the list of substances that were against NCAA rules, and he got suspended for a year and then ended up transferring out. But that's what happened with him. So it's something that still goes on. Most of the time, it's a deal where somebody's taking something and they don't know exactly what it is. But, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, you know, you guys, you guys get drug tested? Yeah, I'm a cheerleader. All the athletes at Sheldon State get drug tested. Okay, gotcha. So, you know, it's still an issue. It's just most of the time now it's hidden with something else. It's, it's, it's something that's performance enhancing. The NCAA is always battling to figure out what the next thing is, what the next undercover drug is that you can buy online or whatever else. Did you have a question? Okay. That's all right. All right, anybody else? Okay, cool. Um, real quick, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you that we are. We, we'll be on campus. Um, Brianna has actually has an office in the SOAR Institute. So if this is something, this is something that you want to know more about. If you'd like to learn more about the drug culture or uh, chemical comp and, and stuff like that, if this is something that interests you, if you'd like to get involved with prevention stuff on campus, you can stop by her office and see her, and uh, she can tell you about some stuff that we'll be doing in, in the weeks and months to come. I guess. So I'll let you guys out of this, and if y'all would just get on there and type out uh, three quick things that you might have learned today, that would be awesome. Uh, I think that module is called, uh, I think it's got pride in the title. Yes, the pride, uh, I think it's pride drug awareness. Yeah. Yeah, and if you've got, if you got suggestions, if you got something else that you would like to discover drug-wise, you can put that in there too. And make sure you've got the sign-in sheet.